Today, we're going to be talking about a new AI-powered teaching assistant that we have been building over the last several months uh, called Capsim Tutor. And I want to introduce uh, myself and my colleague, Eric. Uh, my name is Jordan Novak. I lead our uh, products and services team here at Capsim. And then, of course, alongside me, I have Eric Smith, which I'm sure all of you know. He's our internal Capsim celebrity. Uh, he's the director of our client relationship consultant team. Um, so we're going to be talking to you about uh, Capsim Tutor, which is our AI-powered simulation tutor. And we're going to get into all the nitty gritty and show you how it actually works. But just so you have a little bit of an insight as to how we're going to be spending our time uh, this morning, I'll be kicking it off and talking about a little bit about our AI journey. This is not gonna be a long history lesson uh, or a long history lesson about AI, but I'll share a little bit of insights as to how Capson has been thinking about AI over the last uh, several years. And then I'm gonna kick it over to Eric, who's gonna jump into the solution. Ultimately, based on where we've been thinking about AI uh, over the last couple of years, what did we actually come up with? And most importantly, we're gonna show you use cases and you know our mantra here at Capsum is that people learn best by doing. So we're going to be doing some of that today. We're going to live demo it, although you're more than welcome to uh, play along on your own screen as well if you actually wanted to. So after we go through the use cases, we'll take a quick step back and just think about some considerations, where are some good places for this to be used, and, and what are some things to think about as we're implementing this into our class. And then I'll share some thoughts and uh, plans for the future of where we're going to go. So let's talk about AI. And I will do a quick reminder that we are recording this session. Uh, so uh, if you can't make all of it, um, by all means, we will uh, record it. And if you do have any colleagues that you think are going to benefit from that, just reach out to us and we'll make sure they get the recording. And this is a Zoom webinar. So there is a Q&A section at the bottom panel of your screen. Uh, I teach at DePaul, and I never use the webinar feature, so uh, please use the Q&A portion instead of the chat portion uh, for your questions. All right, let's talk about AI. You know, it's funny, when I was talking to my boss about this yesterday, he was like, AI, 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 and I think that's the best way to kind of sum it up, is, look, we've all heard about artificial intelligence, you know, for a long time, but my gosh, has it really increased in the discussion over the last few years. We're not gonna get into all of the uh, considerations when it comes to using AI in the classroom and higher education, but we know that it's here and it's here to stay. And we're all trying to figure out how to tool this into our syllabi and put it into our academic code of conduct and all of that fun stuff, but it's here, it's here to stay. So let's talk a little bit about it. You know, over the last couple of years, we've been really paying attention to not only the technology of where AI is going, but how our customers perceive AI. So really, what is the perception of it out there? And I would, I, I think it's best summed up, at least with our experience talking to literally hundreds of professors over the last couple of years about this topic, is there's people that are in three camps. One camp is, yes, give me the latest and greatest I need AI. I don't know how many, but I want it. I need it in my classroom. This is going to totally change the way I, I teach. Small percentage. There's also the, on the other side, the small percentage of customers that have said, I don't like this. I don't want this. I resist it. I was laughing with one of the, one of the faculty members at DePaul. It's like, I think you were also the person that probably hated the graphing calculator when it came out. And, and that's okay. Um, but the, the challenge is it's here to stay. Again, small camp, small camp that love it, need every little bit about it, and a small camp that are saying, I don't want anything. Where we're really finding a lot of our customers are in the middle, where they say, listen, I get it. I know we have to do something around AI. I don't know exactly how I need to do this. Shoot that case study that I use or that essay that I have my students do or that report I have them do. I have to rethink that. But what we're, what we're really hoping uh, to do, and we've already received a lot of validation from many customers like you already, is that um, I need a way to introduce AI into my class that's actually going to add value and help. And we looked at this from two key problems that we actually observe out there and, and learning from you. The first problem is, you know, students need to be taught how to appropriately leverage AI and, and that technology. 
And I can share that even with our, uh, our corporate customers, they're already using AI, AI in a really significant way in their businesses. So they're expecting that the graduates that are coming up um, into their companies are going to have some familiarity with AI. So the first problem was, all right, we got to figure out how to teach them and appropriately leverage this technology. And the second problem was we didn't want to just slap something around AI to our products and say, we do AI. We really wanted to be intentional and see where is the problem? Where's the challenge? And we found uh, that there were a lot of problems and challenges that we could solve with AI. And I'm gonna kick it over to Eric to start dipping into the solution and, and demonstrate what this looks like in action. Eric? Thank you, Jordan. So this probably won't come as a surprise to many of you, but the the first testing I did when I saw AI becoming more and more of a thing and hearing students are using it more and more in their courses uh, was I did what I would call some job security testing. Uh, I went to chat GPT and I started asking questions to see if I could beat CAPSIP. Uh, I will say I was pleasantly surprised with how bad some of the answers were. Uh, but then it dawned on me that students are still going to go to chat GPT. They're going to ask these kinds of questions. And now I'm worried about it spreading misinformation, right? It's going to, it's going to cause problems for students. Uh, well, that's when we started thinking about solutions, right? And you know, as Jordan mentioned, we'd been paying attention to where the technology was at. And, you know, we decided the route to go would be to train a custom chat GPT for each of our simulations. So there are eight uh, of these tutors that we have created, one for each of the simulations uh, that is trained up on all of the nuances specific to that simulation. So without getting into too much detail, uh, these trained GPTs, uh, they know everything you would want a student to review before you put them into their groups and told them to start making decisions. On top of that, we've also supplied some internal resources, right? There's been a lot of uh, frequently asked questions over the years. Uh, we created FAQ resources for these um, for these tutors to be able to reference so that they know how CAPSIM would answer the same question when it gets presented with the same type of question. Now, as a plus, um, these these AIs don't sleep, right? It's, a, it's the first time we've had a 24-7, 365 support tool available to both students and professors. So, I would say the simple goal here as the support team has been designing and refining these AIs uh, over the past several months, it's been to make your lives easier. And as a trickle down effect, we hope it makes our lives a little easier as well in that the AI tutors can answer a lot of the questions that normally get directed at you or at us. So, looking at who is CAPSIM Tutor for, primarily I would say it's for students, right? It's designed to answer simulation questions, but there's use cases for everybody. On the student side of things, it's going to help particularly with onboarding, right? Learning the rules of the game. How do I structure my team? Uh, you know, how do I save decisions? What are the rules of the game? Uh, from basic to complex, it's designed to guide the decision-making process. It's not going to just tell them what to do. And I, I will you know, show you how this works here in, in a few minutes. Uh, but whatever questions they can dream up about the simulation, uh, they can feel free to ask. Same story on the professor side. It can answer your questions on the fly. Uh, one way I think a lot of professors will use this tool uh, is to suggest questions for the students to ask. So most of you can probably relate to this, especially if you teach in class. Uh, you'll ask the groups if they have questions and usually there's not a peep, 
right? There's not a hand that gets raised. And then as soon as class is over, uh, I'll have, you know, two groups waiting to ask me a question before I can exit the room because they didn't want to ask the question in front of their competition, right? So one way it can save you time if you're pressed for time, you've seen the reports, you've debriefed the results, suggest some questions for them to ask, right? What what are they struggling with? Uh, do they need to understand uh, you know, how to see their teammates' decisions, or is it something more advanced? Like, uh, you know, how, how can we use the December customer survey scores uh, to develop a better sales forecast or anything in between? Uh, now on the professor side of things, you know, this is one of those tools where, you know, I'm dreaming up ways that you could use this. You might plug in the page one results and ask for a summary, does a pretty decent summary. You might ask it to create uh, some quiz questions on the R&D department. Uh, it could do that too. Uh, but this is one of those tools where, you know, I, I want to hear from you. How are you using the tutor? And, you know, things like, here's what I wish the tutor could do. Uh, so as, as we move forward, I'm really interested in hearing your feedback. I know I saw a few names uh, that are attending this webinar now uh, that I've already talked to uh, over the past couple months about these tutors. So excited to hear your feedback uh, as you, you know, get your hands dirty using them. Uh, let's take a look at the Capsum Tutor in action. So I'm going to pause the slideshow here and we are currently signed into my professor account. Step one is knowing how to get to the tutor. So we're going to go into our course. Same story if we were a student. We you know, go into Capstone 2.0 in this case. And then in the top right, we will see help and support. Uh, this is located in the same location on the professor and student side of the website. So just tell them help and support. It's in the top right corner. Once they click it, you'll see the Capsim Tutor banner. Now, Jordan will talk about this later, but if, if you need a link for the tutor to put into your LMS or you would just like to have it, let us know. We'll share it with you. Uh, but you can click anywhere on this banner. It doesn't have to be the, the go button. You can click anywhere. It's going to open up the tutor if you are signed in to ChatGPT. Uh, if you're not already signed in, uh, well, if you don't have an account, you'll be prompted to create a free account. If you do have an account, sign in. You can talk with the tutor. Um, there are some suggested questions here. I'm just going to ask a basic question. What is MTBF? And you'll see the tutor. Uh, it'll give me a quick definition for what is MTBF. Uh, and it'll also give me a follow-up question. Uh, or something to think about with my group so that we can continue the conversation and continue asking more questions. Now, in the essence of time, uh, I went ahead and had a conversation with the AI uh, before this webinar, uh, so we don't have to wait for it to populate the responses. Um, I started with that, what is MTBF question? Uh, then I started thinking about some useful questions a student might ask. You know, what are there's three people in my group. How should we structure our team? Uh, and it talks about how we could potentially uh, divide up the work amongst our three team members. Well, what if we have five team members? Uh, you can see it gets a little more granular in terms of the departmental assignments. It's adapting its response. Uh, how can I see my teammates' decisions? This is a question I've gotten many, many times over the years. Uh, it tells me exactly what I would need to click in order to see my team's decisions in the spreadsheet. Now, this is one of those examples for why we trained a tutor for each of our simulations. The steps that students would click in our older products like Capstone or Foundation or Global DNA, uh, the steps are a little different. Uh, then they would be in Capstone 2.0 or Capstone Core. So these responses are always tailored to the simulation that you're using in your course so that it will match up uh, with what the students will see. Uh, another follow-up question might be, is it okay if everybody on our team saves decisions or should we only have one person save? Well, you know, the AI talks about 
if, if you are going to have multiple people saving, it's best to divide up the work by department. That way you're not overwriting each other's decisions. I would say if you do nominate one person to drive, so to speak, well, that's when I'd want to use all decisions just to make sure we didn't miss anything. Uh, where can we see what decisions have been saved? Uh, again, step by step, go to decision summary uh, under the reports tab. It'll itemize every upload that's been made by their teams. Uh, once they're in the sim, and they start asking more specific questions. Uh, this is a good one that I might tell a student to ask. Uh, how can your team improve profitability? Well, you could increase prices. Of course, you want to stay in the price range for the market. Uh, you could reduce your costs. You could boost sales. Uh, and then it give us you know, three follow-up questions that we could ask related to the same topic. Uh, one that caught my eye here was on reducing costs, it talks about material and labor. So I asked, what are labor costs? And it explained, uh, you know, they're influenced by automation. Uh, at lower automation, labor costs are high. At higher automation, labor costs are low. Uh, you know, then things to think about with our group. You know, how can our team decide the optimal automation level to balance labor costs and R&D flexibility? Uh, same story for material. Uh, it explained how it's calculated, more things to keep the conversation going. How could I improve sales forecasting? This is one that I looked at and I said, hmm, I mean, technically, yes, I, I would want to use the survey scores, but it doesn't really show me how in this example. So I had to ask a more specific question. Uh, you know, it talks about the set, the survey scores. So I said, uh, what's the December customer survey score? method of forecasting. Uh, and then it explained how I can use my survey scores to calculate my expected market share. And you know, if I multiply expected share by demand, that's how we get our forecast. Uh, how could I improve the survey scores? Gets into those details, better aligning your products with the criteria. So it talks about conceptually what a student should be thinking about when they're making the decisions it's not telling them how much to type in or what numbers are perfect. Um, if I ask for something specific, like what should I price product Baker? It'll tell me, you know, we can't provide specific pricing as decisions should be based on your company's strategy and the customer buying criteria. But, you know, to decide on your own price, you need to review the segment, you need to look at your competitor's pricing, and you need to, you know, balance profitability. You need to remember your unit costs and things like that. Uh, so last couple here, can you give me an example how to forecast? Uh, well, you know, talked about calculating the unit demand, estimating market share. So, well, can you give me an example of how to use the survey scores to do a forecast? And it got a little more specific. It said if my score was 30, the total of all competitors was 300, you know, we'd expect 300, 30 over 300 or 10%. Uh, so we'd use that 10% to estimate our uh, sales. And, you know, at this point, uh, I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint. I think you can see how this functions, how there's always uh, additional follow-up things to think about or questions to keep the conversation going. Uh, and again, it's 24 seven. So it's there when the student needs it, when they're ready to make their decisions. Yeah. And I'll make a, a real quick point on this as you're getting back into the, to the presentation, you know, when we train uh, these GPTs, Imagine we took the, the AI model and we said, great, it was all of that, but then I want to stuff all of the information about our simulations in that. Watch every video, read every document, talk to every CRC. It's essentially a uh, uh, great high level how we trained it. And then we said, all right, the important thing here though is contextualize all this information with our simulations. Don't talk about, you know, when they were asking a question about profitability, it's not going to give you a broad answer about how a corporation can increase profitability. It's going to give them the answer sp more specific about what they need to look through for their simulations. So it contextualizes all of that. Even the MTBF stuff that Eric was talking about, it's going to get really into the nitty gritty of like, all right, it's reliability, it impacts material costs is what you need to know. Yeah, look at the range and the customer buying criteria, all that good stuff. 
Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Jordan. That's really what makes these trained uh, GPTs so much better than if a student were to go to chat GPT and just start asking CAPSIM questions. Uh, they're going to get much, much better answers interacting uh, with the GPTs that have been trained by CAPSIM uh, to answer these sorts of questions. So what are some considerations? Uh, it can only answer simulation questions, right? It doesn't it doesn't know what the weather will be tomorrow. Uh, these are offline uh, trained GPTs. So they're not going on the internet to find answers. Uh, it's going to be limited to CAPSIM queries only. Um, it can't provide specific answers based on the round, the results, the course. It doesn't know the particulars of your course. Uh, it doesn't know what round of the simulation you're in. Uh, it doesn't know... It, it can't see the results of your current simulation. So, you know, the example I used with with um, quite a few professors uh, when I was uh, having all of those calls over the last couple months was, you know, I would think of it like the tutor knows the playbook, but it can't watch the play, right? It it It's there to help, but it can't provide the same level of strategic guidance that you can when you're looking at the report and you can see what the team is doing and you know we can ask them what strategy they're trying to run and what were you what were you thinking about when you made this decision those sorts of things uh, and obviously it can't teach your course either right there, we're always going to have a need for the professor for capsum support we're not going anywhere just to be clear uh, the goal for these tutors is simply uh, to improve the quality of life uh, for both the professor and student and give them help when they need it. Uh, you know, we've cleared out that that support inbox uh, before we've left work at, at eight o'clock central time uh, ever since we opened CAPSIM. And every day when we come in, we have an inbox full of emails because students have been up working on their simulations long after we went to bed. <laughs> so they can finally get some help uh, when they need it. I'm going to hand it back to Jordan here to talk about the future plans for what we have in mind for AI. Jordan? Yeah, and, uh, you know, even the 24-7 the aspect of the AI, which I think is sometimes, it's not often uh, thought about that they really do have access to this at, um, at all times. The other uh, trend that we've seen uh, and I'm sure you've seen in the classroom is that students are absorbing information and communicating and interacting with technology very differently. And some are looking, some are going to be reading every book, every guide, every note. Uh, some are going to be watching videos. Some are going to be just in time, right then and there. Uh, so we think that uh, leveraging uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT and, and training our content, training it on our content is, is going to really offer itself to the most amount of students um, because we get they don't always want to pick up the phone or they don't want to ask you questions or they don't want to send you an email or maybe they already sent you an email so they don't want to send a follow-up. Uh, this is where it's going to uh, help. But for the future, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, a, a two-year roadmap about exactly where we're going to be. Um, but I can give you the broad strokes of how we're thinking about this. Um, and right now, uh, the name of the game is really refine and innovate. Uh, so we recently released these uh, tutors to everyone. We went through um, a closed beta period of time um, several weeks and, and a couple months ago uh, to make sure that things are operating as intended. Um, but they certainly need to be refined based on how the masses are really going to be using it. And we have limited knowledge of the, the inputs that our professors and students are putting into it because it's, you know, certainly using a third party, uh, it's using open AI software. Um, so we need to learn from you and, and hear how you're, how you're using it to better know how we can improve it. But after, you know, just thinking about the context of of the tutors being available in the existing use cases that we shared. Um, there's definitely the thoughts to extend this technology to many other use cases. And I'll pause for a moment. I know you're looking at that debriefing word and probably getting excited uh, and say, I think there's so, this is one of those technologies that um, we've released that we've identified that customers are gonna use this in completely 
uh, unintended and unimagined uh, ways. And that's the exciting part. So we need to hear what are some of those ways that are, you know, that our customers are using it to see if that might be where we want to spend more effort. Uh, but I can tell you that the technology and AI is getting so much better. And I know we hear about that, but it is getting so much better. A couple of years ago, we tried to get the AI to debrief, to really look at the results and actually formulate a debrief. It didn't do a good job. In, in fact, it did a really poor job and it oftentimes got, it, it returned back incorrect information. Even six months ago, not there, but better. One of the ways that we're thinking about extending uh, the use case is for debriefing. And one of the cool things that AI can do is it can aggregate. Imagine one of my most frustrating things, like I'm in round seven and I want to like really recap everything that was going on for all the different rounds, the trends, what was happening. That's what this can do. And that's where we're exploring how it can really create rich debriefs for you. Pull in uh, real world examples. We've had some early success uh, where um, you can present it with certain scenarios. And it's like, all right, give me an example of when um, uh, corporations, you know, large corp a, a large company has run out of inventory. And, you know, give me some links to that. AI can do a really good job of that. What we're hoping to provide you is a really nice scripted tool that you can really just click a button and say, give me the debrief and either send off to your students or prepare a presentation around it, or just print it out and use it as the notes as you're talking through uh, the simulation reports, however it really works for you. But ultimately that is to say, we need to listen to you. We're, we're not going to make major uh, investments right now about the next thing that we're gonna do. We're certainly gonna refine and make that initial experience that we rolled out um, as strong as possible, but we need to hear from you and, and see where you want us to put the effort there. So that's on the future. Um, and before we close it out, I just want to uh, bring it to the next slide where we talk about, you know, next steps. Are you interested in using this? And I can already see there's, I was trying to go through some of the questions already. We have several questions to get into, uh, and we certainly will. But if you're interested in using Caps and Tutor, good news, it's ready right now. Eric showed you how to get in, uh, but by all means, we can uh, connect afterwards if, if you need any help navigating. Uh, any of the, the simulations that you're using, just hop into the help and support section of it. And you're, you're, you're going to see it on your side, but your students are going to see that as well. And it's going to link you to that specific tutor. My recommendation is share the link with your students. Um, we know that they're going to be using AI in the first place. So let's at least have them use curated AI that's going to give them the right information. And that's going to guide them and help them in the process. So share the link with your students. Um, you can certainly tell them to go to the help and support, maybe just spend a little bit of class time the next time you see them and either show them how to navigate to it. Um, you can grab the link, put it into your uh, Blackboard, your learning management system and just send a quick announcement. Um, but certainly guide your students to this. Uh, try it out yourself. Let us know what you think um, and keep us included in the conversation. I gave you Eric's uh, direct email address. I should have put your cell phone number on there, Eric, but uh, we want to hear from you. If you have any thoughts, feedbacks, quick impulse, uh, you know, quick reactions, quick takes, send them over to Eric or uh, your, your CRC or just the general support team. Any way you can give that feedback to us is going to be invaluable. Uh, so please go ahead and do so. But we're going to open it up to the Q&A portion right now. And I, again, I haven't had a chance to, to really look through all of this, um, but um, there are a couple of questions I do want to address right off the bat. Uh, are you getting rid of caps and support? Absolutely not. Caps and support is always going to be here. Um, this is just an assistant for them to be, to have this available to them um, in case they don't want to reach out to us. Um, but our support team is certainly a differentiator for us at Capsum, and we know it's uh, such an important tool for you. Um, so our support team is going to be here. Hopefully, if they're uh, if they have less time that they have to spend on answering some of those direct questions that are kind of knowledge based type of questions, we can help you know support you even more uh, in in teaching your course. How much does this cost? Uh, there is no cost to the user. Uh, the way that we are using this is it uses OpenAI's uh, and custom GPTs. So all you need is a free account. 
to be able to access it. If you do have a premium account, a paid account, you can also access it. So it, it really is available to everyone. Um, how do I give feedback? Hopefully we just went over that. Shoot Eric an email, uh, call us, uh, send a message to uh, Capsum, to support at capsum.com. When can I use this right now? You can certainly uh, use it uh, right after this uh, webinar right now. Um, some verbatim questions here. There's so much valuable information here, but looking at the thread you're showing, I can see how students might get lost in a rabbit hole. How do you suggest setting guardrails so that students don't waste too much time interacting with the GPT? You know, uh, Professor, I, I have not seen that feedback where students are spending too much time into it, but my hope is that uh, they're going to think about what kind of questions do they actually have? Like, are they getting started questions? Like, how do I, how do I see who, where, where my team is, you know, who's on my team or how do I, you know, where do I go first to learn about this? It's going to help them with that. So I would recommend that the questions are more broad until they know how to refine them. But I think even as they're interacting with uh, the AI, the fact that it gives some follow-up questions, I agree, you can, you can drill down 30 levels deep if you want and, and beyond an infinite amount. Um, but I think that's gonna help the student understand a little bit more about the simulation. And sometimes they don't know what they don't know. So that's why we're trying to pose those questions. Like these are some good things to know or some good questions to ask around this subject area. Um, but certainly want to hear more about that. Um, based on some of the data that we've seen, I, it doesn't look like any individual users are getting stuck too much into a rabbit hole. So we'll have to learn a little bit more there. Another question is, how do the questions differ if these questions were asked in a general chat GPT instead of the tutor? Yeah, uh, we've tested it with a lot of questions. Some, it will give you good information. The trick comes into the prompting in the, a lot of those cases because you need to say, I am using CAPSIM's foundation simulation and then give it your question. When you do that, sometimes it will give you the correct answer. Sometimes it'll give you a, an answer for a different simulation altogether or competitors. It, it's, it, it does some weird things. Uh, there is a phenomenon in, in AI called the hallucination and while the hallucinations are decreasing in chat GPT's just standard, let's just say their 4.0 model, um, these are really refined. And we've trained it to say, look, we're giving you a ton of information over here. This is your knowledge base. These are some rules that you have, you know, how to be appropriate and how much, you know, length to spend on a response and all that and, and some of the behaviors, but it's all contextualized around our simulation. So we know we're giving you the right answer for the right simulation. And it's not something that was just dreamt up or thought of. The misinformation, unfortunately, can be pretty extreme. Okay, still looking through some of the questions. Uh, one of the questions is about the performa. The student said, oh, my, I saw my performa, but the results didn't actually happen that way. If you ask it a question about the performance, it's trained on that. It knows that those are, you know, uh, what if scenarios that, you know, if your decisions come true, then those are the uh, outputs that you'll receive. Um, so, yes, that was actually one of the test cases that we, we've we had. So, yeah, um, great to see. Not a question. Just want to say thank you for hosting. Very informative. Great. Good luck in class. Uh, from my perspective as an instructor, it would be useful to ask specific team performance questions like, what are the major updates to Baker over the pre prior four years? Or which team is best executing on their specific basic strategy? Yeah, though, that's great. I mean, hearing that uh, can help us refine how we start um, to innovate once we can feed uh, the AI specific game data from the simulations. Um, so I, I completely agree. That's uh, definitely something we'll save down and, and think about as we're uh, exploring the debriefing options. Uh, another professor said, not a question, but language capability is a big plus. Thank you for mentioning this. I asked a question about customer satisfaction in Mandarin and got an answer in English. Can student answer, ask questions in any language? Yes. 
any language that OpenAI supports, which is basically all of them, AI does this really well. And we've had uh, multiple Spanish speaking uh, um, team members internally uh, and, and team members that know Polish and some of these other languages. Um, they've looked at it and yes, you can get responses in any language and ask questions in any language. Students go directly to ChatGPT rather than this uh, the solution we created. Will they get the same answers now since you have developed the tutor? No. A big con uh, early concern that uh, professors have shared with us, and we follow uh, GDPR regulations, so the, the data protection regulations, our uh, custom GPT those questions do not chain, uh, do not train the overall open AI large language model. So if you've heard about those news reports where somebody accidentally put in a bunch of social security numbers and, and uh, employee information, and then all of a sudden they got, some random person got that out because the model was trained on that, that will never happen uh, with this. That's a company-wide policy that our administrators have made sure that even our internal tools that we use um, AI for, it's not going to change the model. So we don't have to get into any of those uh, concerns. We'll see how the industry evolves and if that becomes a, a concern for the future as well. How does the AI know the difference between a question from a student and a question from a professor? Um, in this case, it doesn't. Um, and the good thing is it's not as it's trained right now, it's not gonna give them any deep insights as to answers on something. Um, so if if the student's asking it, or if the professor's asking it, you know, what is eerie me to do to get out of this hole? It's not gonna tell them specific decisions. Um, but that said, if you wanted to start using it in different ways, like write a syllabus for me, you know, based on an eight week course, it can do that. A student's just not going to really uh, prompt it in that way. All right. So one of the slides mentioned that the tutor can be used for generating quizzes. How can we do that? Uh, Eric, if you want to just play around with that in the background and see if, if that's something we can live demo. Otherwise, uh, Professor, we can certainly uh, chat offline about that. Um, but we have we have used it to uh, create many sample assessments uh, already for us um, just to see what the behaviors are. And the beauty is it's trained on everything about, let's just say, capstone. It's trained about everything. So you can say, write me a quiz, a multiple choice quiz that's 10 questions long. And uh, have it be about, you know, what they should have learned. Uh, from going through the getting started. It'll do that. If you want to add Bloom's taxonomy to it or AACSB uh, accreditation standards and things like that, it'll do it. So um, I don't know if we can directly uh, demo that, but um, Professor, we're writing your name down so we can uh, talk about that further offline. Okay, we're going long. I'm getting yelled at on my side. It's 1138 Central Time. Uh, wanted to thank everybody so much. Uh, Eric, thank you for uh, demonstrating the uh, the capabilities. Thank you so much. Um, again, this recording will be distributed after, um, after the webinar, and we need to hear from you. Share this with your students uh, at your comfort, and let us know what you think about it and what questions you have. This is uh, fantastic. So thank you all. Happy Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck if you're teaching any courses this afternoon. Take care, everyone.